Today, I'm interviewing Dr. Daniel Z. Lieberman. Dr. Lieberman is actually the Vice President of Mental Health at Hims and Hers Health. Maybe you've seen some of their commercials. It's a breakthrough company in the industry providing direct access to prescriptions for men and for women in, in for men and for women in different areas of health, which is really cool. He is also a clinical professor of psychiatry and behavioral sciences at George Washington University. And he's received several awards over the years for his teaching and his research. He is the author of the international bestseller, The Molecule of More, which talks a lot about dopamine, which we'll be discussing in today's episode. And it's also been translated into more than 20 languages, which is fascinating. He's recently written another book called Spellbound, which is about modern science and the unconscious mind. And we also dive into that topic today as well. He's published extensive psychiatric topics in different books, in different journals, and is a part of helping the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, the U.S. Department of Commerce, and the Office of Drug and Alcohol Policy. All that to say, he's very smart, he knows what he's talking about, and you will have a ton of key takeaways, I am sure, from our conversation. Be sure that you hit the follow button if you're watching on YouTube or if you're listening on podcasts as it will help the show grow and it will help you be notified when new content like this comes out. Without any further ado, let's dive in to today's episode. Dr. Lieberman, you have written, I, I believe, one of the best books and probably the most best-selling book on dopamine that's out there. It's called The Molecule of More. And I know you've recently written another book called Spellbound, but you are kind of the like the person people look to to really understand dopamine with, with what you've written in your book, translated into dozens of languages. Uh, it's pretty awesome. Like, did you ever expect that the book was going to be that much of a bestseller? You know, it was a little bit of a surprise. But uh, when I started researching the market, uh, thinking about writing a book about dopamine, and I realized that there was nothing out there for the non-specialists, I thought, wow, this is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, this might be a popular book. Yeah, well, it absolutely is and has been and will continue to be, I'm sure. When when I think about dopamine, it's really had its moment in the spotlight over the past couple of years, in part with your book and and just society, I think, catching on to this this thing and what is it? What would you want people to know are the key takeaways of dopamine and why we should care about how it works inside of our body? I think what I would want people to know is that dopamine is so much more than the pleasure molecule, which is what it's typically conceptualized as, that it's really about orienting our attention to the future and trying to make the future better than the present. That is a wonderful thing to carry around in your brain from an evolutionary point of view, because it's constantly making you think about having the future be safer, uh, more resource rich than the present. The problem with it, though, is that by orienting us to the future, it takes the attention off of the present. And that's not healthy if it's unbalanced. And, and you pointed out that there's a lot going on in our society, in our culture, that is focusing us on dopamine. Mm -hmm. And I think that the reason for that is that when you start thinking about making the future better, it makes you dissatisfied with the present. The present's not as good as it might be. And um, companies take advantage of this because they want you to be dissatisfied. They want you to be unhappy because they want to sell you on their message that they have the solution to it. And just like drugs of abuse, which are intimately connected with the dopamine system, lead to compulsive use, lead to addiction. A lot of what companies are doing, especially social media companies, are designed to get us addicted to their products. So how does dopamine work in our bodies? Is it that we become unpleasant or we see something we want and that spikes dopamine? Or is it that dopamine spikes and leads us... I don't even know if I'm saying it right. Can, ex can you explain how it actually works in our bodies? Dopamine is usually set off by some kind of a cue. And uh, we call this a uh, reward prediction error. We go through life um, and within our environment, there are things that are the same old, same old, but sometimes there are things 
that are new. And when there's something new, it indicates that the environment is not what we expected it to be. It might be more reward rich. For example, you discover a, bre- discover a brand new bakery just opened up in your neighborhood. Um, and that's a reward prediction error. Y- y- you weren't expecting that. Um, or it could be something negative. You might be standing in line at the new bakery for your latte and all of a sudden your cell phone goes off and your boss is saying, come into the office right away, drop whatever you're doing. You expected the reward of the latte. It was a prediction error. You don't get it. That's actually going to make dopamine crater. And we all know the deprivation and feelings of resentment that that can lead to. Yeah, absolutely. I I remember being fascinated when I heard that if you were anticipating something and then it didn't happen, that leads to a worse feeling than if you just hadn't been expecting it at all. Yes, that's right. That's right. Dopamine chugs along. At, um, we, we measure how quickly the neurons fire, and it's about five to 10 times per second under normal circumstances. Mm-hmm. When we see something that's potentially rewarding, a new opportunity, um, somebody we're attracted to across the room, it can zoom up to 10 times that rate. But as you point out, when we're expecting something and we don't get it, it shuts down completely and goes to zero. So is dopamine unique to humans or do animals have it as well? Animals do have it as well. And one of the things that um, my co-author and I, Mike Long, point out in the book is that there are different areas of the brain where dopamine is active. Some are more primitive and found in many, many other animals. Some are more advanced. uh, And these are found most particularly in humans, but other animals share them as well. The, the advanced dopamine is always orienting us towards a better future. And that can come with impulsivity. It can come with energy, motivation, and excitement. Um, but a more advanced circuit of dopamine in the brain leads to a longer term view. And that's involved with planning. Hmm. It's involved with manipulating abstract concepts. And there are some animals that have a surprisingly high level of this. Now, you wouldn't be surprised to hear that animals like dolphins and chimpanzees are pretty high, Mm -hmm. uh, but corvids, blackbirds, and crows may have the most after humans. And if you go on YouTube, you can see these amazing videos of these birds solving multi-step complex problems, building a tool, and then using that tool to solve a problem. So uh, for some reason, um, these birds are amazing. That is, I mean, that's fascinating. In your book, you also talk about dopamine in in how it presents in individuals in different areas, politics, um, relationships, different things like that. So is it that some people are more wired to be more sensitive to dopamine versus maybe be, being more resistant or maybe in the way you put it, are some people more wired to be more future focused versus more here and now? And then how does that play out in different areas of our lives that make us different? Definitely some people are more sensitive to the effects of dopamine than others. And as with all things associated with the brain, there's probably three factors. Uh, Big one's going to be genetics. Mm. Um, We see that with uh, drug use disorders. Um, if, if a young man has a father or an uncle who suffers from an alcohol use disorder, his risk is going to be much higher than mm. the general population. It's also influenced by early life experiences. The brain is constantly changing and growing, but that happens most rapidly when we are very, very young. And so the kinds of experiences we have, particularly in terms of our relationships with our caregivers, uh, will have a long-term effect on the development of our brain. And then the third is our current environment. And as I mentioned, we live in an environment that encourages us to be very dopaminergic, focused on dopamine. So, you know, there can be different ways of being dopaminergic. If you have um, issues with this primitive part of the brain that we discussed, we call it uh, the desire dopamine, you can become impulsive. Maybe you'll be at high risk for abusing drugs. Maybe you'll be a hedonist, always wanting to go out to clubs and um, eat good food, drink alcohol, and chase people you're sexually attracted to. It can present in other ways as well, though. If you have a very active control dopamine circuit, 
That's the more advanced one that involves the prefrontal cortex, which is the most advanced part of the brain in human beings. You're going to be focused on the future in a different way. You may be a type A personality workaholic. While everybody else is enjoying time with friends and family, you're in the office, um, slaving away for a future that will never arise. Uh, one, one thing we talk about in the book is that the people who are best able to afford beach houses are the least able to enjoy them. Mm -hmm. uh, they're out there on their porch looking at the, well, they're not looking at the beautiful view. They're in sight of the beautiful view, but they got their laptop open. Mm -hmm. And we, we've all, we've all gone on vacation and seen people sitting poolside, you know, with, with their cell phones, communicating with people back at work. One other way it can manifest itself is with an excessive overweening passion. And we see this with inventors and artists and musicians where they are just so focused on creating this thing that's new, this thing that's never existed before, that they will not eat, they won't shower, mm -hmm. they'll stay up at all hours of the night just working, working, working. I I'm a bit of a computer geek. And I remember when I was in junior high school, uh, my school bought this digital mini computer and I programmed a skateboarding game on it. And I was so obsessed with it. Uh, I'd wake up in the middle of the night and start scribbling down, down lines of code. Um, and, and it can be very, very rewarding, very, very pleasurable. Uh, but like other dopamine manifestations like drug abuse, it can absolutely take over your life. What's the opposite of dopamine? So the opposite of dopamine is being very focused on the here and now. And that can be also be a very wonderful thing. Um, I think that the, uh, the best manifestation of that is mindfulness mm. when we try to be immersed in the present moment. Um, here and now involves things like sensory perceptions, uh, emotions, um, in the brain, oxytocin, the experience of just being with another person, mm. uh, not to accomplish anything. Uh, it's not a work meeting, but just enjoying the presence of another human being. Mm. Uh, so these are the good ways the opposite of dopamine can manifest itself. Um, just being in the present moment, being happy, um, enjoying what we have, experiencing gratitude. More negative ways would be the lack of motivation. Um, the, the kid who's living in his mother's basement, who's just um, living for the moment, um, watching video games, and really not thinking about the future at all. Is dopamine then something that we should, I don't really love the word hack, but something that we should learn how to use in our favor based on certain situations? And if so, then what would you say are the actual best ways to shift the dopamine in our brains to, for certain seasons of our lives? What we need is a balance. We need a balance between focusing on the future and enjoying the here and now, uh, all of the good things that we worked for. And um, we tend to be unbalanced on the dopamine side, um, thinking about possibilities, hypotheticals, kind of living in a world of um, almost ghosts, phantoms, things that don't exist. Mm -hmm. So we need the balance. And what I find is useful is to pay attention to what mode I'm in. Am I speculating about things that are possible or am I focused on the present? And asking myself, is this where I want to be? Mm. Am I in a dopamine moment or am I in a here and now moment? So when I'm at work, uh, when I'm writing a book, those are dopamine moments. I'm speculating. I'm creating things that never existed before. But when I'm at home, when I'm with my family, when I'm with my friends, uh, when I'm just relaxing, when I'm taking a walk, that's a here and now moment. And I, I, I try to shift into it. I try to shift into sensory experiences, thinking about what are my emotions right now and trying to suppress daydreaming, thinking about what's next, thinking about work, thinking about shopping. And, and that takes work and it's hard. And um, I'm not particularly good at it. I, I try to make myself better at it through things like meditation, uh, and, and just being aware of my shortcomings in that area. So we, we've got, we simply have to pay attention, decide where we want to be, and then work to get to what we want. Mm. I, I believe you have children or a child. Is that correct? Two sons. Two sons. 
So how are you raising them to find a balance as they are like as as their brains are developing with here and now versus anticipation? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, If you had ended your question after how are you raising them, that would have given me a wonderful (laughs) opportunity to pull out all my hair and say, oh, my God, I have no idea. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Uh, Raising children is hard. Raising children is hard. Uh, and, and I think that, um, you know, people like me, psychiatrists, people who study the human brain, who study development, mm-hmm. I don't think we're any better at raising kids than anyone else. Mm. Um, you know, I, I think that the best I can do is try to give a good example. Um, it, it's important to talk to your kids. They hear some of what you say, um, but you don't know what they're hearing and what they're not. Mm. I suspect they're hearing the stuff I don't want them to hear. Mm. And, and the stuff I do want them to hear is just passing right over. So I, I just struggle to set a good example. And um, I, I have to believe that that's going to be the most helpful. But, uh, you know, no, as a psychiatrist, I've learned trying to mold the behavior of another person is incredibly difficult and usually fails. Mm. So, and also when we try to raise our children, what we're trying to do is raise an ideal version of ourselves. And and that's not what they are. They're somebody completely different. And in many cases, they're going to grow up to express a lot of the things that their parents couldn't express Mm. or didn't express. So it's a long answer. You really tapped into a, uh, a sensitive part. Uh, yeah, I, I just don't know how you raise healthy, happy, strong children. Mm. Well, I believe you'll see the fruits of your labor in years to come. I, I hope so. I, I believe that you will. What do you love about being a psychiatrist? There are so many things I love about being a psychiatrist. Um, it's a very intellectual field. It, it, it's about problem solving. And I love, pro- I love solving complex problems. Mm. There's nothing more complex in the entire universe, literally, than the human brain. I uh, that. There are more connections in the human brain than stars in the Milky Way. And there's so much about it that we don't know. So it's so exciting, um, the, the advances that happen l- almost every month in our understanding of the brain. So you combine this wonderful intellectual challenge with the ability to help people, to Mm -hmm. change their lives. Mental illnesses have such a profound impact on the quality of people's lives that when people get into treatment and the symptoms start to be alleviated, their lives can just blossom in so many ways. And, And it's wonderful to be a part of that. So these are some things that I absolutely love about being a psychiatrist. But I think that the thing I love the most is having somebody meet with me and tell me their story. I, I've always loved stories. You know, I, I was the kid who, you know, wasn't passionate about the baseball team or the football team. I just wanted to read. Uh, I r- wanted to read stories. So I feel like it's such a privilege uh, to be able to hear these stories. And, and it's an amazing thing. The things that people will tell a psychiatrist are things that often they've never told anyone else in their life, not even their closest family members. Mm. And it, it's such a privilege to have people open up their psyches to us and let us see and get an understanding of them as individuals and human nature in general. Mm. So there's many, many wonderful things about it. Do you feel like as a psychiatrist that you have to have hope or need or need to have hope for people, even when they don't have it for themselves in situations that that seem hopeless, maybe even where you feel like it's hopeless, but you have to maintain this sense that things can get better? Yeah, that that's one of the hard things about Mm -hmm. being a psychiatrist. We, We can't change people. You know, there's a there's an old joke. Uh, how many psychiatrists does it take to change a light bulb? Just one, but the light bulb has to want to change. <laughs> Love it. Uh, so we, we can't change people. And yet at the same time, we have a significant level of responsibility for them, mm-hmm. a legal level of responsibility for them. Mm-hmm. And mental illnesses can be devastating and people often come in hopeless. 
and, and that's the hardest thing about being a psychiatrist is having to somehow find a way to get them out of that, keep them safe while the medications mm -hmm. are working, while the psychotherapy is working, mm -hmm. uh, when they don't have any hope for themselves. And I, I've lost many, many nights of sleep over that. Mm. How do you maintain hope? How do you keep a positive mindset and outlook when you're carrying the weight of a lot of other people's burdens? Yeah. You know, we spoke about um, the balance between dopamine and here and now. Mm -hmm. And I think that this concept of balance is something that is a recurring theme throughout many aspects of, of human life. Mm -hmm. And so in this case, I, I try to keep a balance between a humanistic level of empathy for the patient, of, of caring for this other person in my life. But it's got to be balanced with a certain amount of um of dispassionate um, stepping back mm -hmm. and um, trying to view them as a scientific problem that needs to be solved, taking a more dispassionate approach to the patient. So, you know, on the one hand, the dispassionate approach can be very cold, but the more emotional connection can lead to biases and mm -hmm. it can lead to distortions because uh, you get an unhelpful desire to save this person, mm -hmm. which you can't do. Yeah. So sometimes when I feel myself uh, slipping into that despair, I say, okay, I, I need to take a step back. I need to be less emotional about this. And I need to approach this as a scientific problem. Uh, and, 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 and patients can feel it. And sometimes they don't, uh, often they don't like that. Yeah. But I, I explained to them, listen, uh, if we're both floundering around in the swimming pool, we're both going to drown. Right. One of us needs to have their feet on dry ground to mm. pull the other one out. Mm. So sometimes I need to disconnect a little bit emotionally. Yeah, that makes total sense. What are the things, behaviors, practices, habits, beliefs that you have seen patients embody that really can help them lead to a positive change in their life? You know, for, for people who are suffering from mental illness, the most important thing is to accept that illness, which can be very, very difficult. Mm -hmm. I think we have a much easier time accepting uh, physical illnesses than we do mental illnesses because the mental illnesses really strike to the heart mm -hmm. of who we are. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of people will spend years and years and years just pretending they don't have it, pretending like it's something that will go away on its own. And it's only when they really embrace the role of somebody who needs to work to get healthy that their life gets better. So that's people who are sick. Mm -hmm. In terms of people who are healthy, I think that the most important factor that leads to a successful psychological life, one that's characterized by growth, is understanding that we grow through adversity. Just like weightlifters, bodybuilders need resistance to build their muscles. Human beings need misfortune in order to grow. Um, I had a patient whose father grew up in a very wealthy family and he, he had a trust fund, never had to work a day in his life. Mm -hmm. And, you know, his son loved him dearly, but he said, this man is a child. Mm -hmm. He never faced challenges that he had to overcome. On the other hand, people who face big challenges and are not crushed by these challenges. They grow, uh, they deepen their personality, they broaden their outlook on life. Um, they learn to take pleasure in small things that mm. before just passed them by. So we, we do everything we can to make our lives happy and comfortable and successful, and we should, but failure at that is super, super important for growth. And when the adversity comes along, when misfortune comes along, um, we need to embrace it and say, okay, this is an opportunity. This is a hard task that's going to lead me to grow. Mm -hmm. So you take the stance that adversity and misfortune at some point will come to everyone. So just kind of wait till it comes or do you, I don't, this might sound silly. Do you encourage people to go find it somehow in order for them to grow? Yeah. 
I think that misfortune is going to come to everybody. But yes, we should seek out. We shouldn't seek out misfortune. We shouldn't seek out terrible things. We should seek out challenges. Mm. We should regularly push ourselves outside of our comfort zone. Mm. Um, you know, one, one example is um, just, just, you know, getting in front of people and doing a presentation. Mm. Uh, the, the fear of public speaking is the number one fear in America. Um, Jerry Seinfeld's got a great bit. He said, number two is death. So if you're at a <laughs> funeral, you'd rather be the guy in the casket than the one giving the eulogy. Oh my goodness. Yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, Johnny Carson, you, you, I, I, don't, I don't know if you remember him, uh, yeah. w- one of the most beloved talk show hosts ever, uh, suffered from terrible stage fright mm. uh, every night. It, it was awful going out. But he said that um, when you get that feeling uh, of just terror, of nervousness, of anxiety, that's a signal that you're about to do something that you're going to remember for the rest of your life. Mm. So I, I think that, um, you know, we should play to our strengths. Um, we, we shouldn't always be trying to make ourselves better, but on a regular basis, we should stretch a little bit and seek out things that are going to be difficult. Is dopamine related to that feeling of nervousness or anxiety before you do something in any way? You know, dopamine actually is the opposite. If you've got a lot of dopamine going, you're going to feel confident. Mm. Dopamine is when you're doing something new and you're like, I can't wait to get at it. You know, get out of my way. I'm strong. I'm powerful. I'm going to be successful. Mm. One of the reasons we all love dopamine so much. So then... How I'm sure you've heard the the cold bath, cold shower, and the relation to dopamine. There's nothing in me that wants to do a cold bath or a cold shower. Me neither. But 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 isn't what they say that it increases your dopamine when you're done? How does that work? And is it true? Is it even true? Yeah, you know, uh, I've heard that. I have not looked into it deeply. Um, it, it makes sense to me. Um, I'm not a big cold bath, cold shower, but you know, we've all had to suffer through freezing jumps into lakes or something. Right. And and yeah, it wakes you up. It fills you with energy. It makes you feel strong, ready to take Mm. on the world. Mm. Um, I'm, I'm more of a heat guy. Uh, I like to sit in a sauna or a hot tub. Yeah. And I think that that probably is more likely to stimulate the here and now. Mm. And it's more likely to make us feel calm and content and Mm. just bask in that present moment. And everything is okay. And, uh, I don't need another new pair of sneakers. I don't need a new refrigerator. Yeah. I'm just happy as I am. That's it. That makes sense. Because when you're sitting in that cold bath, the only thing you can think of is the future. You are very much <laughs> wow. anticipating getting out. That's fantastic. So then what led you to want to write a book about the unconscious mind after writing a book about dopamine? Was there a connection between these two? A little bit. A little bit. You know, I, 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 love, I love the unconscious mind. It plays such a role in our lives. It enriches our lives to incredible degrees, and it can absolutely destroy our lives Mm. and uh, wreck everything we have spent a lifetime working for. And I think that um, people don't think about it very much. They They have no idea of its power and the huge role that it plays in their life. Um, so I, I, I did want to write a book about that, um, for, uh, many, many years. I wrote about dopamine first just because it was more commercial. Yeah. <laughs> uh, I figured I can sell that book. Uh, the unconscious did. mind is m- going to be much more challenging for people to read, for people to understand. And, and so I held off on that one. So I haven't read this book yet. If we're, we're going to be completely honest, can you, but now that you've given the teaser, it's, it's very mysterious. And I feel like I have to know, cause you said it can, people don't think about it, which makes sense because it's unconscious, but it can make a huge difference in their life or it could ruin their life. Why? What is going on? Do you take a Fro- Freudian view of it? Like what is this unconscious mind? How do you define it? So many questions here. Yeah. So I think that uh, the best way to understand the unconscious mind is to just rename it the uncontrollable mind. Mm. The, the unconscious is all the aspects of our uh, psychic experiences uh, that we don't have control over. So, for mm. example, emotions. Um, you know, you, you can choose to do things that will ultimately end up in happier emotions, we hope, uh, but you don't have direct control over it. 
And you think about the role that emotions play in your life. Uh, moods, you have no control over that. Mm. Um, you could spend $10,000 to go on a luxury vacation and be in a bad mood the whole time. Uh, mm -hmm. and, you know, we've all experienced that, right? You drag your kids to Disney World, spend all this money, oh and it's gosh. just miserable. <laughs> Everybody's unhappy and fighting yes. and crying, right? So so you have no control over that. Here's, here's a big one. Um, we, we, we spend our lives pursuing the things that we desire. Uh, maybe it's a relationship, maybe it's stuff, maybe it's a career. Um, you ask yourselves, who decides what it is that you desire? It's not your conscious mind. It's your unconscious. And uh, so often we desire things we wish we didn't desire. Uh, from unhealthy food to toxic romantic partners. And, mm. and so that just gives you a sense. The unconscious, the unconscious decides if we're going to be happy or sad, if we're going to enjoy something or if we're not. It also sets the path of our lives uh, by deciding what it is that we want. So, to, but just to give it an immediate sense of the power of the unconscious, um, I, I think that the best example that many, many people have experienced uh, is falling in love. Mm. When you fall in love, it completely changes your world. It completely changes how you feel about yourself and how you feel about your environment. Mm -hmm. um, in the old days, um, it, it was um, attributed to the goddess of love um, because it was so intense. It felt like we were being taken over by a force that was uh, units of magnitude more powerful than ourselves, something divine. And um, I, I think that Carl Jung had the best sense of the unconscious, uh, in my opinion. And he believed that all of the stories from antiquity about supernatural creatures were actually their best attempt to describe the power of the unconscious mind. Mm -hmm. So we've got the goddess of love, uh, Aphrodite, Venus. We've also got a, a god of war, Ares uh, or Mars. And, and, and um, veterans who have been to war know that Again, it is like being possessed by a supernatural creature. Um, the, the, the levels of courage that are able to be expressed on the battlefield mm -hmm. that could never be called up voluntarily. Mm -hmm. and, and, and look at um, athletes. Um, athletes can practice all they want, uh, and, and that's going to improve their skills, of course. But some days they're going to go out there and they're going to have an absolutely inspired performance. Other days they're going to be fumbling with the ball, and it's like they're cursed. And again, in ancient times, this was attributed to supernatural gods and goddesses. Uh, today, we take a more scientific approach and uh, attribute it to circuits in the brain that we don't have control over. But the subjective experience is still one of possession by what feels like supernatural creatures. And so I think it's so important to understand these forces that direct our lives and uh, determine how we're feeling at any given moment. So what influences the unconscious mind, whether from the scientific view of the circuits in the brain, what can influence that? But then are there other things like faith or other people or other different things that can have this influence on the unconscious mind? Yeah. So it's the same thing we talked about before. Genetics is going to play a big role. Mm. Um, your early experiences in life, especially with your primary caretaker, that important relationship is going to play a huge role. And then your current environment, the people around you, the experiences, the food that you eat, the drugs that you take, mm. uh, these will all have an influence. If we think about working with the unconscious mind, uh, trying to have a deliberate influence over it, I think that the pathway we want to take is to acknowledge that there are independent agents inside there that have their own goals mm. and we've got to respect their independence and not try to control them, but to try to partner with them uh, so that we are both working towards the same goals. When you're working against each other, your unconscious mind is going to make you um, self-sabotage. But when you're working together, 
your unconscious mm. mind is going to give you energy, motivation, inspiration, intuition. You, you know, if you think about, um, if you've ever had to write something, write a report that you're enthusiastic about, it's fun. You, you know, you just want to get at it. And while you're doing it, you're feeling great. Mm. That's because you and your unconscious are aligned. On the other hand, if your unconscious is out to lunch and it has no interest in this report whatsoever, yeah. oh my God, it's just torture, just getting every word out. We'd rather do anything else. We'd rather freaking clean the kitchen, <laughs> than, right? So true, yes. Um, so I think an important part of life is, is working to forge a good relationship with these unconscious agents. And... Um, I think that the way we do that is the way that we would forge a good relationship, a friendship with another human being. And that is that the first step is simply getting to know them. And the best way to get to know somebody is to simply listen to them. Listening is incredibly powerful. Uh, listening is a tool that psychiatrists and other therapists use. Mm -hmm. And people don't understand how powerful it is giving someone your full attention. It's so powerful that when a therapist gives someone their full attention for 50 minutes a week, week after week, people who have vulnerable psyches can actually get psychotic from that experience. It's so intense. Um, people from who being are very, listened to? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Uh, what happens is they start to project onto them. And they start to have feelings towards them, the therapist who's listening to them, uh -huh, yeah. uh, that they initially had towards their primary caretaker. And mm -hmm. so feelings of love, feelings of anger, feelings of resentment, uh, wow. and, and the person does, they think, they think they're feeling this way about their therapist, but, but it's a project. So um, mm -hmm. therapists are trained to know, to, mm -hmm. to titrate this, and sometimes we don't do that. We, we don't listen in that intense, uh, prolonged way. Mm. Charismatic people know this. Uh, you will sometimes hear charismatic people described as making you feel like you're the only person in the room. Mm -hmm. And that's because when they're talking to you, they're not looking around to see who's else around. They're not thinking about what they're going to say next. They're not thinking about uh, the next party they're going to go to. They're a hundred percent focused on you. Mm -hmm. And, and it's, it can be a very intense experience. Mm -hmm. So that's how we um, forge good relationships with other people. It's the same thing with the unconscious mind. It's about paying attention. And, and that's going to happen in the here and now. Mm -hmm. When we're in dopamine mode, we're very much in conscious mode. We're planning. We're thinking. Uh, we're using the conscious tools of rationalism, which is an incredibly valuable tool. I don't want it in any way devalue. Uh, the incredible power of consciousness. Mm. But with the unconscious, we're going to be in the here and now, paying attention to how we're feeling, what our moods are, spontaneous thoughts that pop into our mind. Mm. The vast majority of thoughts that we become aware of are, are, are not things we plan about thinking, right. like, like what goes in this cell in the spreadsheet. It, it's just spontaneous stuff. And if we pay attention to those things, we'll get to know our unconscious better. And that's going to lead to uh, a more productive relationship. Are you familiar with Judd Brewer? I'm not. So no. he he's written uh, a couple of books. One was called Unwinding Anxiety, but I'm reading his current one called The Hunger Habit. And you're what you're saying is reminding me, and it's in this book is specifically focused on how to get in touch with your body and your mind to stop fighting your hunger cravings, but instead to have a, a different relationship with food, and kind of his main premise in, you know, a sentence is what you were saying. There's this un uncontrollable part are like the cravings. We start craving food when we're bored, tired, stressed, hungry. There's so many reasons, but we've conditioned ourselves. Like our brain will drive us to go eat in those moments. But when we try and fight it, by going on strict diets or intermittent fasting. Like it just drives the craving even more, which leads mm. people to end up overeating, you know, yo-yo dieting, a ton of things. And, and so his kind of, uh, I'm still in the middle of it, but his answer, so to say, is mindfulness and really thinking through what is it my body actually needs right now before taking action. 
So is that kind of what you would say is how you listen to your unconscious mind? Is you you journal, you meditate, you're mindful, you take some time to think before acting? Yes. Yeah. You know, I think that uh, the unconscious can be conceptualized as human instinct. Mm -hmm. So hunger is an obvious instinct, but there can be very complex instincts as well, such as intuition. Mm. Uh, We have an instinctual understanding of something. Mm. With with animals, they they have basically one way of expressing instinct, and that's through behavior. And human beings express instinct through behavior as well. Uh, When we're hungry, we eat. Mm -hmm. But human beings have a second option. Because we have developed this wonderful tool of consciousness, we don't have to act on all our instincts. The unconscious gives us wonderful, wonderful things. It also gives us the ugliest aspects of Mm. humanity, hatred, Mm. jealousy, rage, Um. If we allow these things to occupy our mind, Mm -hmm. if we don't push them away, we don't have to act on them because human beings have these two ways of dealing with instinct, behavior and awareness. And so a lot Mm -hmm. of times when we have something negative like hunger or something that we are ashamed of like envy or hatred, we try and push it away. We say, oh my God, I'm not like that. I am not that kind of a person. You know, be gone, ugly thought. That's a mistake. Uh, Because what happens is that if you don't allow it to occupy your awareness, it's got to go to option number two, behavior. Mm. And uh, these are things like Freudian slips, when when just something comes out of our mouth. Or, you know, we smash something and and, and it seemed like an accident, but maybe it wasn't. Mm. Or we self-sabotage. And, and so I think that one way of dealing with hunger, with dealing with anything negative that comes from the unconscious, is just accept it. Um, mm-hmm. You know, when you're really, really hunger, hungry, we say, oh, my God, I got to, got to eat something. But if we come into the present moment and say, okay, what is this feeling really like? It's not that bad, mm-hmm. you know? It, 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 it's it, it's not terrible. It's not like, being, not like being in a cold tub or anything like that. Um, I can live with this. Mm. What do you think about the phrase, trust your gut or trust your instinct? Uh, I, I, it's half right. Um, you, you know, I think a lot of times we don't trust our instinct enough, but our instincts aren't going to be right all the time. Mm. So, you know, I spoke about a partnership between the conscious and the unconscious uh, and, and both have something to offer. So I think that uh, we need to be more aware of our gut feelings, uh, but then we need to test them with our rationality, uh, mm-hmm. bring the strengths of both sides of human nature, the human rational and the animal instinct, let them work together. Um, pay attention to your gut feelings, but test them with rationality. Mm. What about how the unconscious mind is impacted by a person's beliefs and values? How, uh, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? How about how the conscious mind is impacted by our unconscious beliefs and values? Uh, Mm. I don't think we choose our beliefs. Um, Values, perhaps we have a little bit more choice, but probably not. You know, I, Mm. I, I think that we, yeah, I, I don't think we we have direct control over our beliefs and values. We can, you know, work in partnership. You know, we can choose to read things um, that are enlightening, mm-hmm. that expose us to new ideas, uh, that promote values we admire but don't yet hold ourselves. For example, um, altruism, selflessness, helping mm-hmm. other people. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, I try to cultivate that in myself, mm-hmm. uh, but I wish there were more of it. And I can't just choose, okay, I'm going to be a more selfless person. Uh, you know, I can act in more selfless ways, but it's going to be an uphill battle. I would much rather be a more selfless person so that I could take pleasure mm-hmm. in being kind to other people. I can't just choose that, but I can cultivate it. Mm-hmm. Um, th- there are certain kinds of meditations that cultivate it. There are books I can read that will make me more like that. So um, I think that um, beliefs and values are unconscious. And that if we want to have good beliefs and values, we, we've got to we've got to nurture this partnership. Mm. 
Is there anything that has changed in your belief about dopamine or about the unconscious mind since you wrote either of those books? So um, writing the book about the unconscious mind had a profound effect upon me. Hmm. Um, And my wife commented, uh, even if this book doesn't change anyone else, writing it changed you Hmm. um, in a good way. And, And I think that the greatest insight I had was that I I sort of realized I was going through life sort of assuming that people were kind of like me, Mm. uh, that, that my beliefs and values were self-evident. They they were obvious. Of course, these are true. Of course, this is the way you live your life. Uh, and that's just not true for other people. Mm. Um, and it really woke me up to how, how different other people are and that, it can be very difficult to make other people understand your internal world and vice versa. Mm. Mm. Has anything changed about your beliefs of dopamine? Um, well, when I started writing the dopamine book, I, I thought it was the pleasure molecule. Mm -hmm. I thought I was going to write a book about sex and drugs and rock and roll. Mm -hmm. Um, and that's why I thought it was going to sell so well. And, um, (laughs) it was when I started digging in to do, you know, we don't know what we don't know. I started digging in on the research and I was like, Oh my God. Um, there is so much more here than I thought. Mm -hmm. Um, this, this is about the future versus the present. Yeah. So the, the main focus of my podcast and what my listeners love to take away from it is we focus on the four areas of becoming our best selves, so to say. And we use an acronym called PIES, which stands for physical, intellectual, emotional, and spiritual. So with that kind of framework in mind, what would you say are some of the best ways in one or all of those categories that people can cultivate a uh, being a healthier version or a better version or the version of themselves they want to be more like uh, through the studies that you've done and the work that you've had in your practice as a psychiatrist? Yeah. Um, I think that the work with the unconscious is most directly related to spiritual. Hmm. Um, And it's complicated. Um, You know, when you when you talk about spirituality, you're, you're talking about things that are supernatural for the most part. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, the natural world, uh, is made up of, um, you know, the periodic table of the elements, um, Mm -hmm. the standard model, um, fermions and bosons, uh, those kinds of things. Um, spirituality goes beyond that. and, And it thinks about things that don't have a physical existence. Now, these things cannot be studied by science, and so it, it, it's a little bit presumptuous to approach it from a scientific standpoint, mm. um, but, but I, I, I'm going to do that anyway. Let's do it. Um, you know, most scientists don't believe in God. Mm-hmm. Uh, most scientists are atheists, but most Americans do. Um, so let's just take a hypothetical that God exists. Um, what, what role would the unconscious mind, and when I say the unconscious mind, I'm talking about brain circuits. Uh, I'm talking about atoms and molecules that make up neurons in the brain. What, what role would that have in, in our relationship with God? And and here's what I'd say. Um, you know, uh, God uses, uh, our conscious mind to, um, to reveal his existence to us. You know, we see a sunrise. We go, oh my God, that's so beautiful. And if we're spiritual, we think about God. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're, we're, we're in trouble. We're lonely. We're desperate. And somebody comes up to us and they look us in the eyes and they smile and they say, let me help you. And mm-hmm. we're like, oh, you know, if you're religious, you're like, oh my God, I'm looking into the face of God with his kindness. Mm-hmm. Uh, so that's how, 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 how we see that through the conscious mind. The unconscious mind is sort of God's back door. And that's when we experience his presence directly, uh, not through our senses. We don't see here. We just feel it. Um, and, and that's God not stimulating the photons in our eyes um, or, or the touch receptors. Um, he's activating these circuits in the brain that are unconscious. Uh, and that's what gives us that feeling. 
So I, I would say that if we can open up those doors, um, you know, we, we can get a better sense of, of God's presence in the world by just paying attention to the natural world around us, paying attention to other human beings and, and their expression of love. Um, we, we can get the other side by trying to open up the channels of communication uh, between the conscious and the unconscious. Um, and, and, and we've talked about ways to do it. Uh, there are ways of ripping that door off its hinges. Um, and, and that's the use of psychedelic drugs like psilocybin, mm. magic mushrooms, LSD. Mm. That just opens up the door and people have these intense spiritual experiences. Whether or not that leads to spiritual growth, I think is an open question. Mm. Um, but um, I, I think that's the way that's the way uh, my book relates to the S in pies. Mm, I love that. Do you believe in God? I do. Yes. How has it or how is it being in the scientific field and community where many others don't and you do? How do you navigate that? You know, uh, it, it's not a it's not a problem. Um, you know, when I'm with other scientists, we talk about science. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> You have other ways you can you can express what you're saying yeah. that makes sense. I, to them. I love science. I absolutely adore science. Yeah, uh, and I, I see absolutely no conflict between mm. God and science. Uh, science will never ever prove the existence of God. Yeah, uh, you know, if science could prove the existence of God, there would be no more need for faith. Yeah. And, and faith plays such a central role in all religious traditions. Mm -hmm. uh, if there is a God, and obviously I, don't, I may believe, but I don't know. If there is a God, uh, that God would never uh, destroy faith by making his existence scientifically provable. So I, I, I kind of believe, to use the scientific terms, they're orthogonal to one another. Um, and, and, and so I'm perfectly comfortable with both, as were many great scientists. Einstein believed in God. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think the greatest scientists believed in God. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it's just your run-of-the-mill bread and butter ones who don't. Mm. Wow. I love that. Dr. Lieberman, it has been a joy and a pleasure talking to you. Um, and I guess it's interesting now when you think of people saying, like, it was a pleasure. Are they talking about dopamine? What? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> it was a dopamine talking to you. No, you, uh, fantastic. I, I've learned so much. And I know that there's so much more we could even talk about. But people can also go and get The Molecule of More, which is the book about dopamine. Your book, Spellbound, which is your book about the unconscious mind, which now I am going to read. I'm getting it on oh, Audible great. this afternoon. It's going to be my next read or listen to over the next couple of days. I really appreciate and value your time. Thank you so much. Thanks so much for having me. This was an amazing episode. I absolutely loved my conversation with Dr. Daniel Z. Lieberman. Here are some of my key takeaways from that fascinating conversation that we just had. First of all, dopamine is not a bad thing, and it's not a good thing. Like It's good and bad in different situations. The real key takeaway here in regards to dopamine is that dopamine gets us to focus on the future and to think about how we want the future to be better, but it can become bad or doesn't serve us well, maybe be a, would maybe be a better way to put it, when we are so focused on how we want the future to be better that we are unsatisfied. Now, the real focus here is that when dopamine is working at its best in our lives, it's when we're focused on planning to make a better future, not just for ourselves, but for other people as well. The here and now is the opposite of dopamine, and it is where we can be really focused and really content on the here and now, on being present with the people in our lives, on having mindful moments, on enjoying just spending a lazy day around with family or reading a book without constantly focusing on what we need to do better or what we need to do next. And as Dr. Lieberman said, the goal here is the balance between the two. There's a time to be focused on anticipation and building a better future, and there is a time to be focused on the here and now. So what is that for you? Where is your balance? And is it currently off balance one way or another? Because again, that negative of the here and now may be for the those of us that struggle at times with focusing only on the current pleasures in our life. We 
We just want to feel how good it feels now. Actually, I believe that's what he said about dopamine when it's more in its primitive way, when we're focused on more of those hedonistic pleasures or hedonistic pleasures of just going and doing what feels good in the moment, as opposed to purposefully thinking about what should be done for a better future, what are the right actions to take, as well as having that balance of being content with the here and now and having time to enjoy the things that we've worked towards building. My second key takeaway from today's episode was that we have an unconscious mind. Actually, I loved the phrase uncontrollable mind. And for me, it brought up having feelings of anxiety that can come about, having racing thoughts, having intrusive thoughts that just kind of come out of nowhere. And again, there's a similar message here in terms of how we handle and understand our uncontrollable or unconscious mind. And that's through awareness. When in your day do you take time to be mindful, to journal, to get in touch with how you're feeling and maybe why you feel that way? That can be a great first step into getting in touch, as Dr. Lieberman said, with our unconscious or uncontrollable mind. And then my third key takeaway from today's episode was the power of when Dr. Lieberman talked about how science is never going to prove the existence of God, because if it did, then there wouldn't be a reason for faith. I love how he explained how our unconscious mind is a backdoor to how God can work in our lives and through our lives. And in fact, when he was talking in the interview about how our unconscious mind is where some of our desires come from that we can't explain in a good way or in a negative way, one of the things I thought of in that moment was Proverbs. Proverbs 4, I believe it is, where it tells us that God will give us the desires of our hearts. And thinking about times in my life where I've had a desire for something good, such as a desire to adopt and a desire to adopt children from India. I don't know where that came from, but that was something that God placed, I believe, that God placed on my heart strongly decades ago long before I ever was even old enough or able to adopt children, long before my husband and I even got married. I believe that God can place desires on our heart for things that he hopes that we will do to further his kingdom and things that he knows will encourage our life and and bring us into his purpose for our lives. And then I believe that there are desires that can be put in our bodies that are from the opposite side when we look at spiritual warfare and how the enemy, Satan, can definitely put desires in our hearts that are not the way that God wants it to be, but they are the temptations that can lead us into doing things that ultimately are not good for us, for our lives here and now, but ultimately they separate us from God because they lead us to want to depend more on that and less on Him. There's so much more we could go into there, but I think at the end of the day, it's beautiful to realize that God works in the natural and in the supernatural because, as I believe, He is God over all of it. I hope you loved today's episode. I know I did. As soon as we finished recording, I was just beaming with how amazing this interview with Dr. Lieberman was. We would love for you to share it with a friend. Please go and share, follow this podcast wherever you listen to podcasts. If you're watching on YouTube, please hit the subscribe button and leave a comment. What did you think of today's episode? We would love to hear from you. Until next week, stay strong.